The Solar Podcast is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. Check us out at cesnrg.com. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today, intelligent project siting for wind, solar, and storage. My guest today is Rich Henry, the Director of Customer Success at Pivot. Welcome to the show, Rich. Thanks, Tim. Glad to be here. Look forward to learning more about Pivot. That's P-I-V-V-O-T. There are many pivots in the world, but this is the double V pivot. And before we dive into your land siting tools, I would love it if you would give our audience a little bit of background on yourself. Yeah, certainly. So um, I've been with Pivot and actually prior to Pivot for now about nine years. Pivot is a three-year-old startup. We'll talk about that here in just a bit, but um, I've been in the geospatial industries now for I think we're looking at about 17 years. So I've been working with geospatial data for a long time, particularly in the energy sector. You know, jobs have ranged from, you know, tech on up to project managers on up to, you know, product owner and product management, which has been a really nice kind of, um, a really kind of nice segue for my career leading up into, um, you know, working here at Pivot and now, now the director of customer success which is kind of interesting for me because, you know, I support our sales teams from a kind of a sales engineer perspective. So I can get really deep with our customers from a technical perspective. And then I get to transition into, you know, if they become a customer, I get to transition with them and start teaching them and, and onboarding them into our platform, you know, making sure that they realize the full value of the, of the product set. Excellent. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I did quite a bit of GIS work in graduate school. And so I really appreciate the power of GIS when it's working well and working for you, so to speak. And of course, with uh, land siting uh, or project siting, GIS is a, an amazing opportunity. Uh, so many different layers of data are now available, either for free or for purchase. And um, it just speeds the process tremendously. I, I don't know if you, you know, I'd love to kind of start at a very high level before we get into to pivot specifics. Um, how has GIS evolved in the last, say, 10 years? Has it gotten a lot better? Yeah, I would say it's gotten a lot better. I think what's I think what's really happened is, you know, we're we're starting to find more and more users that are comfortable engaging with geospatial data. And and really in, in my my humble opinion here, I think Google really helped with that, right? They they took GIS and geospatial data and basically just made it available to the public, right? So people are getting really familiar with maps. They understand how to interact with those sorts of um, you know, that geospatial data from that perspective. And I think, you know, you, you certainly have the highly technical side of GIS and dealing with that sort of thing. You know, for us, our job is, a, is, is to take some of those really complex, really large geospatial data sets, really complicated spatial sort of interaction queries and tasks, and just sort of dumb it down so it's available to basically anyone. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's evolved a lot. So, Let's dive right in. What is Pivot and what do you guys do? Yeah, that's great. Um, so Pivot, as I, as I kind of alluded to earlier, we're a, you know, consider ourselves a three-year, you know, three-year-old startup. Um, we, originally, we originally started out as part of a kind of a differentiator and, and, and we provided services inside an EPC, um, primarily in the oil and gas sector. Um, that EPC was bought by a private equity firm, um, you know, as they're kind of rooting through all of the technology and services within that organization, they identified us um, and they, they considered us to be something that would be worth more on the outside in the, in the open marketplace than, than on the inside. Um, and so, you know, uh, three years ago, we became Pivot. So we brought to market a product that was, you know, built to win business in, in the oil and gas sector and power sector. And now, now we're out here, you know, selling our wares. Um, we're a company of about 25 people. Uh, we, we used to say that our headquarters was in Kansas City, Missouri, but we really no longer have a, you know, an actual building, right? With COVID, we just went all remote. Um, but a good chunk of us are in Kansas City, Missouri. And then another good chunk of us are here where I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. 
And when you say that you came out of the oil and gas and power industries, what exactly was your niche there or is your niche there? There's no harm in working in multiple industries. We have nothing against oil and gas. <laughs> Our economy runs on oil and gas. We're, we're not ignorant of that fact. We're also passionate for the energy transition. And because now we realize that we truly can do it with wind, solar and storage and things like green hydrogen. But how, how is your tool set? How do you refer to it? Do you refer to it as a platform or a tool set? Uh, I would say that when we talk about it, we at, we definitely talk about it as a platform, right? And and that allows us to to be really comfortable in the conversation that we support, you know, several several energies within the energy sector, whether it's renewables, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's rail. Um, so when we talk about pivot, we think of ourselves as a geospatial data and location intelligence platform, right? And the idea is. Um, you know, to empower these, these energy providers with that location intelligence. So, so as you mentioned, right, with, with solar developers, allowing them to go prospecting. And, and you mentioned earlier when you were, when you were introducing the, sh the show, there are, there are layers of ways that these solar developers are actually accessing that geospatial data, whether it's just from a search criteria or whether it's from, you know, defining your usable area or from reporting, right? And then just to kind of elaborate a little bit on that platform, right? We also are supporting EPCs, right? Black and Beach is a, is a customer of ours and they're supporting lots of di disciplines. And in, in, in a solar project or a renewables project, you know, you're gonna have those that are doing that, that site development and those that are gonna have to connect that, you know, that site to the grid. And so we wanna be able to support them as well. And then, and then there's another component, right? Supporting folks that are in the environmental and regulatory compliance um, business units, you know, that's a topic du jour, right? We always need to understand the impacts to the environment. So we definitely think of ourselves as a platform, although we have, I, I guess what I should also say is that, you know, the modules that we have on that platform can stand alone or they can also kind of integrate with them with themselves. Okay. Yeah, we'll get into some of those details and we're going to uh, dive into some case studies for our listeners. So you can look forward to that. You know, Let's let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts, and maybe you can uh, relate those to the platform. You know, you're looking. Solar developers are looking for uh, infrastructure like substations, like transmission lines. They're looking for how to avoid wetlands. They're looking for uh, parcels that they can agglomerate into a site and how to reach those parcel owners. Um, have, I, have I spoken to anything that your platform does not help a developer solve, so to speak? <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to reverse that question. I, everything that you've covered is, is something that we're, we're addressing inside, inside the platform. Right? That, that definitely speaks to our to our siting, and it definitely speaks to our data. And you know, a lot of the data that you just referenced, right, is some of the, you know, some of the kind of table stakes information, wetlands and floodplains and property data and so on. Um, I think, you know, as we as we get into the the use case and we start, you know, exploring the the platform a little bit, you know, what else you're going to kind of find in here is jurisdictional information, right? Who are we going to have to reach out to? What who is the the electrical retail service service tour that I need to you know, contact, which is really relevant to those solar developers and EPCs that are working kind of anywhere in the country, right? But then we take that a step further and start adding information around socioeconomics, right? What is the socioeconomic characteristics of an area? Is that going to be a red flag for us, right? And then, of course, we get deep on environmental information, you know, the bugs and bunnies and the, the streams and the wetlands and so on, but then also the geotechnical information, which which I think is really interesting for us because as part of our conversation, right, we want to sort of narrow, narrow the gap between what the solar developer can do and then what the and then where the engineers are going to have to kind of pick up, right? So, and that to us comes down to the to the data, right? So we can get really deep in some of the geotechnical information so they can start making some of those decisions. 
and when when you think about the the universe of data sets that you know could be utilized in this process of citing energy facilities are are you a uh, layer creator in some way or are you just building a layer cake and really bringing it all together into your platform i think it's probably the latter i mean we are definitely data aggregators um, you know, and so we've gone out and aggregated a lot, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of the publicly available data sets, particularly at the national level, those are great. We understand, you know, we understand how good they are and how to use them. Um, we're also pulling information at more granular levels. So we're pulling information from states and counties. Um, but the, but the other thing, which I think is sort of goes back to you know, your, your description, which is we go aggregate that data. Um, you know, we're not we're not just aggregating some of the common data sets. We're looking for some of those more of those niche data sets. But the other thing that we're doing is we're, you know, with all of this information at our fingertips, right, we can go in and start enhancing that data. Right. So a really good example of that is our infrastructure information. Right. You talked about public publicly available data and some that we you know, folks are going to subscribe to. Um, we do subscribe to um, some energy sector data sets, so our power lines and pipelines and substations, et cetera. But, but as everyone on, you know, all of your viewers are going to know that, that all of those data sets, whether you pay for it or not, are going to have gaps, right? They have their strengths, they have their weaknesses. And so what we're doing is taking some of the publicly available energy data and helping enhance what we have so we can kind of fill in those gaps. So it's not just here it is, take it and leave, take it or leave it, right? We wanna, we wanna be conscientious of that and start to try to improve some of those data sets that we have. And I would imagine that the problem that you're solving for a pipeline is a little different than the problem that you're solving for say a solar farm. Um, you know, one is a rectangle and one is a line uh, crossing a much bigger territory. Um, how did you, how did you have to, I guess, modify your platform to start to appeal to solar developers? Yeah, you're you're definitely right. I mean, these these long transmission lines are really complex because you're crossing lots of juris jurisdictions, lots of state boundaries, and that sort of thing. But but the but it's interesting how much overlap there is, right? Uh, whether you're doing you know an area or siting. Uh, application or whether you're doing a linear application, you still need that same information, right? The same data. You need to understand the property owners you're going to have to reach out to. You need to understand the wetlands. If there are wetlands in your project area. Um, the, the other parallel here is for routing, right? Which is something, you know, I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about is, you know, designing an algorithm, just designing a, a, an interface and experience for the user to go in and start kind of pulling the levers and entering in their criteria. How do we want to drive this route, et cetera? It's the same sort of concept with, with area siting in the sense that, you know, I want to be in proximity to this. I want to, you know, search this entire county. So, you know, I think there's a lot of parallels in it. You know, siting is probably just a little bit less complex. Okay. Cool. Well, is there more of... Uh on the introduction side that you'd like to say about the platform before we get into a few case studies? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I wanna, you know, when we, when we, um, when we think about designing our software, of course, you know, we're, we are, we are putting an experience on top of just tr truckloads and truckloads of data, right? And we're also, you know, as part of that, we're creating, you know, features and functions and so on that are that are basically doing these really complex geospatial processes, right? So, and, and we've been really successful this as a platform even before we were pivot, right? Before we were pivot, and you know, we talked about the routing and being in that oil and gas sector, but a, a heavy emphasis on that was collaboration, right? Building these collaborative sites that allow people within your organization and outside your organization to participate. Well, in order for that to be successful, the platform has to be really usable and, and friendly, right? So we have this mantra when we when we talk about our when our when we talk about our platform, which is it needs to be simple, it needs to be familiar, it needs to be fast. So, you know, we've built a lot of our technology on top of Google Maps. We've already talked about how Google really has brought 
kind of geospatial technology to the to the masses, right? People understand how to type in a search. They understand how to zoom to a location. They understand how to click on the map and get data. So, you know, we're leveraging that kind of strategy in order to sort of reduce the barriers of, um, of entry, right? People need to be able to jump in and use it. And I think the only other point, and you talked about this a little bit earlier about, you know, are we a platform or, or are we just sort of a, a series of applications? And we're kind of both, but we really like to think of ourselves as a platform. And so in order to do that, we need to be able to have something that's very extendable, right? We're, we are looking at within the next two months, adding eight more large data sets to our, to our inventory, right? We need to be able to do that without jeopardizing performance and jeopardizing people's workflows. And so we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time to build kind of an extendable architecture to support that, along with kind of stringing together these modules to support multiple workflows. Okay. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned user, uh, you know, user friendliness and usability. Of course, that's uh, just super important that people can, you know, easily ramp up on the tool get what they need, get the outputs they need, you know, yeah. to bring it into their own tools um, for plan sets, for example. Um, so I understand that you have a, a, a case study for solar siting that you're gonna show us. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Wonderful. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share share my screen. How are we doing? Are you seeing yep. my map? We're good. Excellent. I don't see the little green halo, so I wasn't sure if you could see my the map or not. Okay, um, so what we're looking at is siting, right? This is our, our newest addition to the platform, um, clearly in 2020 and, and before, but really last year, the, that con the conversation around renewables really ramped up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our, um, you know, we, we kind of come out of, 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 you know, pipeline routing and transmission routing. And so having interaction with those types of customers, particularly on the transmission side, was a nice, you know, uh, opportunity for us to start getting getting included in, in conversations around, around siting, right? It was a pretty logical transition for us. Um, what we're looking at right now is, is the siting application. It is literally less than 100 days old. Um, so it's it's hot off the press, but we're already, you know, we've got a dozen now renewable customers that are using the platform. And so we were able to roll it out really quickly, get people engaged. And, you know, we're learning lots and we're improving the platform. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in, right? The idea here is um, when we talk about siting, we can talk about it in two different ways. One, one is you kind of understand the where and you want to understand the what, right? So you come in and you could upload sites and we can help you understand, you know, some of the data in that particular area, um, understand the usable area. So you're not, it's not just about prospecting, right? So you can come in with, with your own locations. Um, the, the siting tool is really kind of focused around that prospecting opportunity. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop in a search here. Um, we're gonna bounce over to Appomattox County, Virginia, right? So we can search at the county level. Of course, we can refine that search to so just give me opportunities around existing infrastructure. Um, you know, another use case would be, um, let me see here, not Smith, it's South Creek, right, which is the name of a substation. So if I click on this, I get a little bit of information about the substation, right? So if I want to, you know, if I want to start my search directly from, you know, a known location, I can do that. Um, so there's lots of avenues on how you can start your, your prospecting. And so once we identify, you know, our starting point, whether it's the county or a transmission line or a substation, we can come over here and, and start driving into the criteria, right? And this is another opportunity where we're leveraging that geospatial data. Even though we're kind of flipping some bits and adding some numbers, right? We're doing some complicated, um, you know, geospatial queries in the background. Um, before we talk about some of these little bells and whistles down here, I want to take an opportunity to talk about this option at the top. Um, earlier, you talked about our data and kind of, you know, whether we're kind of building the cake and, you know, and I talked about how we curate information and how we also in our, are enhancing data. Um, that's, two different, that's two ways that we think about our data, right? The data we curate, the data we enhance, and then, and then also custom data, 
right? So if you have information as a customer that differentiates you from others, you can upload that into the platform, right? So you're not just kind of restricted to the information we have. But as it relates to this kind of parcel, uh, smart parcels versus tax map parcels, um, earlier on, you talked about the ability to kind of come in and, and sort of build these kind of composite parcels based on kind of what you learn uh, in a particular area. Um, so these smart parcels was kind of an opportunity for us to enhance our tax map data, which means that we've gone out, you know, we have, we have 148 million or something parcels in our, in our data set. We've gone out and combed all of those and found opportunities where we have adjacent properties that are owned by the same landowner, and we've gone and aggregated those into a single opportunity, right? So that you don't have to go through the data acrobats in order to do that on your own. You don't have to pull in, you know, external resources in order to merge those together. You know, we've gone through and, and, and done that work, right? And we, we do that each time we update our parcel data, which is now sub two months. So anyhow, that's just a nice example of where we're enhancing that data. All right, so just to kind of jump back into the workflow, what we're going to do here is look for any opportunities that are 50 acres or larger. And, you know, we could refine that to just opportunities, you know, around a substation or near power lines. Um, but we're going to just focus our search around, you know, this area that we clicked on here in the map. Okay, we'll go ahead and collapse this so we have a little bit more real estate. And then down here, you can see our search results, right? So from here, you know, we have a little bit of interaction, right? We can zoom to a particular location. You know, we can turn on the satellite imagery. We can start to see the other properties around me. Um, I feel like this, you know, actually seeing the adjacent properties and seeing that full perspective is something that stands out from some of the others that are kind of in this, um, you know, in this industry, right? Having that full picture is really important. Um, the other thing, you know, as we talk about the data and how we can deliver that information to our customers, um, another way is, these, is the pivot layers, right? So we've taken all that data that we've aggregated, you know, we can spatialize them and show them on the map, right? So if we come over here and turn on things like depth to bedrock, right, we'll, quick, we'll quickly see here that, you know, this particular property here in green transitions between, um, let's see, shallow to moderate depth to bedrock, right? We can see that instantly. Um, if we continue to scroll down, we can see like existing pipelines, right? So we can see pipelines are traversing right through this property. That might be a red flag. It might be a showstopper, right? We can turn on the floodplain information. So down here, you can see some of the floodplains. And if we come down again and turn on things like wetlands, right? The idea here again, right, is to be able to show this information. The customer can rest assured that it's up to date. Right. You can have this information information anywhere in the United States so you can conduct this desktop review. All right. So the next step here in the workflow, let's just go ahead and say that we want to grab all nine of these and um, we want to take it the next step, which is to add it to our project. And I mentioned a few minutes ago how we talked about, you know, our early legacy was around not only oil and gas routing and electrical transmission routing, but it's also around collaboration. Um, so when we think about projects, it's not just about, you know, bundling a bunch of sites together that makes sense. It's also about, um, you know, including others in the conversation, right? Whether you have team members that are going to help vet these sites or whether you're bringing in folks that just want to see it from a view only perspective. Um, and, you know, a couple of the things that jump out at me here, right? We'll have the original site acreage. You can interact in terms of ranking it and so on and so forth. We'll report back to you proximity to the closest substation and power lines. But the next part of the equation here, and you know, in a lot of ways, it's probably the most important part, is the ability to calculate that usable area, which again, you know, leveraging data. So I'm going to go ahead and kick that off. You can see it running over here. It'll be done in a few seconds. But here are the different constraints that we have inside our system, right? And we're and we're trying to go kind of beyond some of the common constraints that you talked about earlier: wetlands and flow plains and properties and so on, right? We also have some of the existing infrastructure. So we can be sure to take those into account. We also have building footprints in our database. So wherever we have footprints for structures, we can you know, create setbacks around that. We'll also allow the user to come in and refine the land cover subtypes that participate in the usable area calculation. And the same goes for the, for the slope data, right? So we wanna, the idea here is to empower the solar developers again, to take this conversation as far downstream as they can before they inevitably have to kind of hand it off. So, you know, in terms of kind of the high level workflow, right? Lots of ways you can kind of jump in and start looking for things. 
picking sites, conducting that desktop review, calculating the usable area, you know, that's sort of the happy path right, you know, right now. And after you do that calculation, does it draw a line around the usable area? Great question. Let's go ahead and map one of these. So here on the screen, again, let me just kind of reduce the noise, right? So we can map that usable area. We can see it in context, everything that's around it. Mm -hmm. And then we can, you know, then take that a step further and, you know, extract that information to provide it to, you know, again, whoever's kind of the next in the workflow. Got it. I guess something else to, sorry to interrupt, but one other thing that to, to add here, right, is, you know, we talked about these sites being smart parcels, right, which is a, which is an aggregation of any adjacent properties owned by a single landowner. So if I come in here and start flashing these, you'll see the original boundaries, right? We can allow the user to come in and start removing some of those, right? Or if they want to extend the boundary of that site to an adjacent landowner, you can do that as well. So you can edit that original site boundary, recalculate that usable area. I think one other thing to point out here is, you know, we talked about building, building footprints for, uh, as an example, we, we don't have 100% coverage, that's impossible, right? That's a moving target. So what we have is really good coverage. But, you know, if you find buildings on your property that aren't accounted for in our data, or, you know, you have um, access rows that are not accounted for in our data, you'd be able to come in and kind of customize some of those constraints so you can update that, that usable area as well. Okay. Cool. And then, uh, but so typically, how is a customer then outputting this information in, in some other usable format? Um, there's, I mean, of course, there's, there's tabular data that one might want with owner information, parcel size, that kind of stuff. And then pulling it into whatever uh, you know, other modeling tools, so to speak, that you're using, right? Right. Yeah, we address that in a, a couple ways. And, and again, getting back to the conversation of, you know, helping that developer take this conversation as far downstream and then, and then you know, inevitably you're going to have to hand it off to your engineers or your GIS techs or whatever. So how can we, you know, how can we keep context to the project and empower that, you know, those workflows downstream. So, um, you know, as far as the usable area and the original site boundary, you know, we, we have to down, I mean, we have to provide it in a KML or KMZ format, right? Because that's just such a portable way of sharing information, right? To take that a step further, we're also gonna package up all of the data that was used to build that usable area. Um, so for example, the wetlands and the floodplains and the streams and so on and so forth. Uh, along uh, on top of that, we're going to also package up things like the soils and the geologic units and the depth to bedrock and the socioeconomic. So all of our pivot data that intersects these particular sites, we're going to package that information up into a you know a common GIS format file geo database, which can be used in virtually any GIS platform. It can be consumed inside AutoCAD. You can also take that into some of those niche solutions that you were talking about where you know, maybe you drop in your usable area and it racks out the arrays for you. And so we're going to, we can extract that physical data um, just to kind of take that a step further um, to talk about some of the other ways that we're providing deliverables. So, you know, as we're, as we're vetting these sites, you know, it's interesting to turn on layers, um, but we, we also want to provide some actual metrics around it. So we generate what we refer to as a parcel report, really generic name which allows us to come in and kind of pick and choose those features that you're really focused on and actually start to put some metrics around it. So, um, so as we scroll down here, we can get some information about the property details. As we scroll down a little bit further, we can start to see what substations are actually in proximity, not, not necessarily just the closest one, but which, which um, you know, what substations that are within say five and a half miles are, are, are near our site. And then we'll start giving you metrics around the floodplain data, metrics around the streams and flow lines. As we scroll down here, you can actually start to see some of the metrics around the, the slope characteristics and land cover characteristics. 
And so the intent of this is to, again, give you kind of a quick at a glance as you're vetting that site, do we want to include it or exclude it? Um, so that's one way we're packaging up data. Um, another thing that we're also providing for each of these sites is a permit punch list, right? And so what we're doing is identifying the federal permits in that particular area, letting folks know whether it's been triggered or not. Uh, taking that a step further, we'll identify the agencies that you're going to have to submit that permit to. And then go in even a little bit more detail here, we identify that permit. We define it for you. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go researching that. And then we'll populate that with the, the exact feature that triggered that particular permit. All right. So that's another kind of deliverable that we're producing. And then, and then this is really where, where I think we start to differentiate from some of our competition in that you know, we have this enormous depth of data and diversity of data, which means you know, not only are we just gonna understand what the usable area is, but we can actually start conducting some due diligence on these properties, right? So as we scroll down here, we won't go through all of these because there's lots of them, but you'll start to see things in here around jurisdictions and boundaries, right? So again, you know, addressing questions like, who are we gonna reach out to and who are we gonna submit permits to? Right, we get into some of that geotechnical information. Again, how can we empower our engineers? How can we identify any red flags that you know we're not going to regret when we get the backhoe out on the property and we find out that you know the bedrock is just right right at the surface? So, you know, what are the soils? Are there hydric soils, et cetera? Right, packaging up that that environmental information. You know, again, try, trying to empower them with as much relevant data to the conversation as we can. For them to kind of make those those decisions, so I think that kind of covers the different ways we're we're delivering data, whether it's in a report format or in that in, or 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 in that kind of physical GIS format. I have kind of a wonky question. I love um, wonky questions. <laughs> for uh, this is uh, for those smaller or startup developers that maybe on the fence about an all-in subscription to a tool are there are there subscribers that will offer these services you know the use of your tool or similar tools on a on a service basis is that yeah, we have, that like civil engineering firms would offer yeah well i mean we we definitely have you know epcs that are that are you know own our platform and are and are using that to solve some of these um, you know, solve some of the prospecting challenges. It's not, you know, it's not just solar developers by, by any means. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing it kind of across the, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And can you talk about pricing at all? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, I guess, you know, we're, you know, we're small enough and, and new enough to where we're, we're pretty agile when it comes to pricing. Right. So we're, you know, we're kind of in the, if we have small small businesses, you know, that are working in a single state, you know, we'd have a, a price for them, right? One user, one state, um, and then on up to kind of, you know, the enterprise sort of solutions. But, and then it's anywhere in between, you know, we have folks that want to pay monthly. We want, you know, we have folks that want to pay by the year. We have folks that want to, you know, five states versus all states. So, you know, right now, as we sort of narrow, narrow that all in, we're trying to be as flexible as we can, but, you know, we also want to be, we also want to be successful. Yeah. And do you see any, uh, any patterns? I mean, the solar industry tends to be quite geography specific. You know, you mentioned Virginia in this case study. Virginia is kind of an up and coming market right now. Maine is an up and coming market. Right. Then there's some established markets, and then there's kind of the uh, in-betweens, like Illinois was uh, a boom, now it's a bust. I'm just curious uh, where you're where you're seeing a lot of activity. Um, you 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 hit it on the you hit it on the um, right on the head there. We're, we're we're seeing a lot of activity kind of in the Northeast. Um, we're also seeing that that that's getting pretty saturated with with a lot of developers and folks that are kind of working in that area. Um, you know, we, we recently had a subscription where they were focusing on Tennessee um, and Virginia, New York and Pennsylvania. Um, they were also in, interested in, in exploring Nevada, which was kind of interesting to me. I would, I would think that that was probably pretty well understood. Um, we have a few customers that are still working in, in Texas. 
Um, and then, and then there's some activity also in, in California. Yeah. I mean, Texas is, uh, a really hot market. I think they're going to surpass California for the uh, quantity of installed solar this year, perhaps. And, um, but California is going strong. You know, I was just looking at a story today about the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. They're, they're taking seven gigawatts of nuclear power offline in the next five years. So that's a lot of, uh, yeah. that's a lot of wind, solar and storage. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I really enjoyed that, uh, that case study. It's, you know, it's very understandable what the value proposition is. And this is just a huge time and money saver um at the end of the day and i could even see some cni applications i don't know do you uh commercial industrial where we're looking for uh rooftop large rooftops that kind of thing has has anybody been using this kind of a tool for cni development do you know that definitely is a tricky conversation for us because most of our most of our data is is really really lends itself to utility scale. Um, we definitely had have, have had conversations with commercial and industrial and, and rooftop. Um, you know the the need there is to get some of that more municipal level data, so that local distribution, um, you know the zoning and that sort of thing. And you know those are the unicorns right now, right? And if we can, you know, we have we have some ideas around how we can supplement our platform with some of that information but you know the utilities have to make it available um, the other trick for us is being able to keep that data up to date right so we you know we guarantee our customers right now that our data our data sets that we have in there right now are going to be updated anywhere between 30 and 90 days you start dropping down to that municipal level data that gets really tricky so yeah. you know we're we're definitely kind of crawling into that conversation um, so not a lot of activity from that from that front yet. Yeah, the number of local authorities having jurisdiction is in the tens of thousands right. uh, in the United States. So that would get tricky. Cool. Well, um, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And and so I'm kind of at your mercy. Are there other aspects of the tool? I noticed there was this smart parcel nomenclature in the tool. What is that about? And yeah, explain that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we kind of talked about it briefly during the siding demonstration where um, smart parcels is a, another example where we're enhancing data that we have, right? So, um, you know, we have, we have a nationwide parcel fabric. Um, and so what we've done, you know, based on conversations we had with our customers, what we've done is we've gone through that entire data set and found opportunities where we have, you know, um, adjacent adjacent properties that are owned by a single landowner, and aggregate aggregated those into a single opportunity. So you can find you can find these large opportunities where you're just talking to a single you know a single landowner, or you know maybe you know maybe you have an aggregation that's owned by another landowner right next to it, and so now you're not having to do those you know acrobatics in order to kind of aggregate those into uh, you know a single opportunity so that's that's kind of where smart parcels came from mm -hmm. yeah okay and what what are the different other differentiators you know um, in you know that separates you from your competitors How, you know if, if if I'm kicking the tires on on siting tools, why do I settle on pivot versus some other? Some other solution? Yep. Yeah, I think, I mean, out of the gate, when, when, we, when we talk about pivot, you know, we do talk about ourselves as a platform. And so, you know, again, the ability to kind of string together disciplines, string together workflows is really, is really important. Um, you know, that may not be the case for some of our solar developers, right? They take that conversation to a certain point, sell the opportunity, and it kind of moves on. Um, but, but I think the, the biggest, one of the biggest differences is going to be just the sheer volume and diversity of data that we, that we have, right? We're not just focused on the constraints, 
right? We're focused on giving you that complete picture. So, you know, you as a developer can red flag a property, take it out of the mix, you know, before it moves into, you know, other workflows. Um, you know, we, we talked about the different ways that we're, we're kind of wrapping up that data, whether, whether it's showing the pivot layers, you know, anywhere in the U.S., keeping that information up to date, whether we're, you know, it's generating that permit punch list, whether it's generating that parcel report, whether it's generating our full-blown kind of pivot reporting showing, you know, everything that sticks to a site. Um, you know, I think that's another, another thing that we're, you know, I would say is a differentiator for us. And then, you know, we talked about the enhanced data, right? We talked about the smart parcels. I think the last thing that I want to, I probably should bring up is just the people, right? We're not, we're not a five person shop, right? We're a 25 person shop, which means that we have the ability to go deep with lots of our customers, right? It also means that as we're learning and, you know, we're learning, we're hearing suggestions, we're hearing ideas, we can roll those out really quickly, right? And so we're able to respond to our customers in a, you know, in a pretty quick manner. Like, I mean, we're right now we're iterating and rolling out new releases with siting every two weeks, right? Until it kind of settles down. So, you know, having, having that breadth of talent gives us the ability to kind of respond to our customers quickly. So walk us through, I guess, the onboarding process. What can a developer or user expect how much handholding can you do and how much customization are you willing to consider? Yeah, that's a good question. But right now, given our, given our size, um, you know, I, I participate really early on in the process, you know, as we're, as we're talking to new prospective customers, I'm really involved in that conversation to add some of that technical, technical dialogue, which means that I get to meet these folks early on. I get to understand their, their workflows. And we have other folks in the customer success team that does that as well. So once a, once a customer becomes a, a customer, right, we, we, we engage with them on, on training. And that is, you know, we jump on a Zoom call, we jump on a Teams call, and we do that training live. We'll record that information. So any dialogue that pops up is in context to that particular customer. Of course, we've got help center and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the other thing that we do, we'll typically do with some of our training is have a follow-up session, you know, a week later where we'll jump on a call and just hear their feedback and dialogue with them. And then, you know, we just make ourselves available, right? Just, just yesterday, I jumped on a 15 minute call with a customer that wanted to walk through a new, a new use case. Um, as far as, you know, what, what a customer can expect in terms of, you know, stamping their DNA and, you know, this is our workflow and adding some customizations to it. Uh, we're pretty cautious with that. You know, we have a lot of experience in software development and what we don't want to do is build a siting application or a platform that just satisfies, you know, this, this workflow and this customer. And so, you know, we gain, we, we gather a lot of information, we synthesize that and we put eyes on it and we have just really real conversations, which means sometimes we're going to say no, right? It's not, it's not something that we want to do, right? Otherwise, you know, particularly when it comes to data, um, you know, we've done a lot of kind of custom one-off data sets for, for folks. And for example, um, we had a customer that is involved in doing pipeline risk, right? They needed, they needed lightning strike data, right? We, you know, in two weeks time, we gathered lightning strike data and provided that to the customer. Black and Beach, who I mentioned earlier, right? We also work with their telecom business unit. They needed comm tower data, which is not, not trivial, right? I mean, it's like 5 million records across a dozen different agencies. We aggregated all of that information so that they can, so that they can make decisions on fiber. They can make decisions on expanding rural Wi-Fi, et cetera. So, you know, to a certain extent, we're definitely willing to kind of jump in there and customize things but it has to fall in line with where our direction is. Sounds like the telecom space might be a space you're, uh, you're gearing up for uh, yeah. because I mean, with the, with the infrastructure bill pending right. in, in Washington, there will be uh, a lot of investment going into broadband as well as renewables. Yeah. So. Yeah. It should well, be an exciting year. Yeah, exciting couple of years here. Sure. Um, I need to make a couple of announcements and then we'll let our listeners know how they can reach you, Rich, 
Um, I'm going to put my landing page on screen. You can reach me, Tim Montague, at cesnrg.com forward slash podcast. This is where all of our interviews are. Please subscribe to the channel with that red button right there. Give it a thumbs up. Please share it. Uh, and give me feedback. You know, I'd love to hear ideas for other speakers. We've been doing a, a, a series now on reducing the soft cost with SunSpec and TigerCom, um, Solar and Storage IRR with Andy Klump from CEA. Uh, that's gonna be one of my more popular interviews probably for 2021. Thought leaders like Jim Spano, again, beating that solar and storage drum beat. He's developing virtual power plants across the country. So check out all of our content at cesnrg.com. And you can also reach me on Twitter, TG Montague on Twitter. Uh, I want to thank you, Rich Henry, with Pivot for coming on the show. And how can our listeners reach you, Rich? Yeah, Tim, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and your, and your viewers. Um, certainly, you can go to our website at pivot.com. That's, again, P-I-V-V-O-T. And then you can just email me directly at rhenry at pivot.com. And again, Tim, really, really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rich. Let's grow solar and storage.